Welcome everyone back to day three of Pivot 2022, all hands on deck. My name is Rebecca or Becky Schultz. I am a consultant at the International Energy Agency where I specialize in fuel supply, investment, and more recently, geothermal. I want to welcome you to our session today. It's the first panel of the day and it's titled Envisioning a New Techno-Economic Model for Geothermal. And I'm excited to be able to moderate this session for you and also to introduce our panelists as well. I'm going to take a very democratic order in introducing our panelists, starting with uh, first alphabetical by first name. And so if I may begin, I would like to introduce you to, to Daniel Cohen from Rice University. So Daniel, please um, introduce yourself and, and tell us what you do in geothermal. Yeah, great to be with you, Becky, and, and everyone else. Um, I'm Daniel Cohan. I'm an associate professor of civil environmental engineering at Rice University. And uh, my research touches on a broad array of aspects of, of air pollution, climate change, and energy. Um, earlier this year, I published my first book, um, Confronting Climate Gridlock, and in it, I devote a chapter to what it will take to, to clean up electricity and, and really became more and more interested in geothermal over the course of writing the book because uh, it could be such an important complement to the more variable output that we get from wind and solar power and really look forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Daniel. And next, if I may, I'd like to invite Rani Koya, CEO of OGL, Geothermal, um, to come on and introduce herself and tell us what she's been doing recently in Geothermal. Thanks, Becky. Um, great to be with you all today. Um, I'm Rani. I've, um, I'm the CEO of OGL Geothermal, and um, we've been um, uh, going for about a year and a half now, and we're focused on geothermal power. My background is in engineering and uh, in the oil and gas industry. I've been uh, an executive and a um, project manager for major projects all around the world. And I think, um, like Daniel, I see an enormous opportunity for geothermal as we look ahead. And I'm sure we'll touch on that as we go forward. I think the second string that I bring to this is I have a public policy background, and it's really interesting to see the interaction of the private sector and the public sector, particularly in this geothermal space where uh, it's going to take uh, all hands on deck. Thanks, Ronnie. And next, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Simon Todd. Simon, please, you've been doing quite a lot both on the oil and gas side and more recently in geothermal. Tell us where you're coming from and, and what, you're, what you're focusing on now. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Thanks very much. Um, uh, yes, Simon Todd. Um, I'm uh, oil and gas background, uh, including 25 years with BP. Um, now I'm into geothermal. Um, I've co-founded a company in, uh, based in Ireland called Causeway Geothermal. Um, we're focused on uh, decarbonizing heating and cooling in large commercial, industrial and public service uh, facilities. Um, it's for us, it's not just about uh, climate, it's also fastly coming about uh, energy security and even affordability of, of, uh, of energy. Um, our, our innovation is twofold. Uh, one is on the technical side, techno-economics, and the other is on the commercial side. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be involved in this uh, uh, conversation today. I'm looking forward to both trying to share and certainly learn uh, from the panel. This is indeed going to be a very dynamic panel and I can't wait to, to get started with all of you. I have the honor, to, the honor to introduce as well a good friend of mine, Tim Lyons, who has also been bridging this gap between oil and gas and geothermal more recently. So Tim, please come on and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing recently. Thanks, Becky. Uh, well, I've been in the industry well, the energy industry for 40 years, uh, and of which around 30 has been in oil and gas, probably a couple uh, in geothermal, the last two, and somewhere in there, eight to 10 years of energy policy uh, work with the European Commission, helping to, uh, to bring the Eastern European countries into what was called then the acquis communautaire or the common accord. And I was responsible for elements of energy policy for all those 13 countries. Um, my, uh, my day job uh, has been for a while, uh, looking to raise finance for oil and gas companies and also to report to stock exchanges and banks, etc., on resource determinations, uh, competent persons reports, they're often called. And I've been looking to apply the very same techniques to the geothermal sector uh, and trying to recognize what sorts of returns on equity 
would be demanded by uh, uh, dispassionate investors and also the same with debt and royalty type projects. Um, that'll do me for the moment. I'm sure we're going to be learning a lot from each other over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, 50, 45 minutes. Um, the focus on this panel is really about the geothermal techno-economic model. And, and in the course of this, in previous discussion, this is part of a two-part series where yesterday we were focusing on the technology, uh, the technology uh, levers that we can use between oil and gas to geothermal to help drive down costs or help to make geothermal perhaps a bit more competitive. Uh, and that's from a technology side, but also ways of working and other elements. In today's session, we're gonna focus a bit more on the techno-economic side of that and, and not just some of those le levers, but I'd like to, like to start there, but also move into what are some of the other market mechanisms? What are, the other, some, what are some of the other value chains that we may be able to move around in uh, and understand both what industry can do, what countries can do, um, and what we can do as individuals within that to help bring the ge a geothermal techno-economic model forward. And so perhaps to start, let's start with the basics of geothermal um, in terms of what do we see as being the key levers. And within this context, maybe for this initial start, Let's start with power generation and direct heating and cooling, and we can expand as we go from there. But what do you see for those that you know have been watching geothermal for a long time, or those that are entering into it in this first couple of years with perhaps a different set of eyes? What do you see across the geothermal landscape that we may need to do to improve the, let's say, the viability um, and the uptake of, a, of geothermal? Tim, can I perhaps, yeah, can I perhaps yeah, yeah. bring that one over to you if you want to kick us off with that? Yes. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd observed for the last two, two days, uh, which I have really enjoyed and I've learned a lot, is there is a fair focus uh, between the US and Europe uh, in terms of the speakers. There have been, there's been a very interesting one from Japan and one or two others uh, outside of that kind of uh, main main orbit. And and it prompted me to, uh, to think about... Um, where do people do things a bit differently? And is there something from that that we might be able to learn about? And what I was drawn to uh, initially was China, uh, because China, by, by a, a country mile, um, produces the most amount of usable uh, direct heat um, across all the, all the globe. Um, and, and it does so in quite innovative ways. Uh, some of the things that uh, it does is it focuses on oil and gas companies to provide the expertise to roll out geothermal and other types of, uh, of renewables. So something that certainly we're looking at same this, this side of the pond. The other thing is it demands uh, change from its customers uh, to suit better the geothermal resource that it's able to provide. Now in China, there, aren't, there isn't very much very hot water, uh, but there's useful hot water, maybe at 70 or 80 centigrade. And one of the things they've done is they've engaged with district heating companies uh, and said, well, what can you do with water at this temperature? Because you may or may not be aware, but generally speaking, uh, district heating uh, uh, companies run at about 80 centigrade. But what they've done is they've demonstrated that by uh, collaborating with the end user, they can make use of a resource that otherwise might have been pretty uneconomic. And just to use one quote from a, a particular company is at the moment, uh, district heating with geothermal energy in China undercuts coal and undercuts gas and has done for a decade or so. So it's not the recent hike in fossil fuels that's done that. So that's my first message to you is, let's look around the world, find out what people have done and find out how they are trying to solve problems based on the resources they have. Yes, I think that dives well into a heat value chain discussion as well. And actually, how do we make the most of that and try to capitalize on that? Just around Ronnie, Simon, Dan, any other observations that you have seen in your last few years moving into geothermal or, or before in terms of what are some key levers that we may need to, to focus on to improve the techno-economic um, situation or model? Ronnie, please go ahead. Yeah, I guess, um, Becky, we were talking um, a couple of weeks ago about um, the importance of baseload power. And I think there's an enormous amount of um, conversation about what it will take to really get to net zero. 
And, you know, nobody's more excited than me about solar and wind and so on. But this whole idea of a system level um, uh, reliability, security of supply, and that requires a different mindset. It's not just a question of saying, well, you know, how many kilowatt hours can we generate or how much heat do we have? But making sure that that matches demand. And to Tim's point, that requires supply side um, reliability and calculations and in terms of making sure that pricing reflects that. And also demand side, as Tim mentions, where customers are more intelligent and or more informed, I should say, not more intelligent, but more informed about when energy is available and when it's not. So I think geothermal has a really important, I think, let's, let's, let's agree, for, certainly from a power perspective, a niche role to play, but a very important one. I think it has um, almost a unique um, ability to provide um, perhaps that missing 5% in the energy dynamic and the energy transition that we're looking at today. So I think it everything to play for, um, but a lot to do still. Does anyone wanna jump in on that? Yeah, just to build on it really, um, uh, Becky, building Rani's point, um, and, and you know, perhaps we'll go back to the, the, you know, the techno-economic basics, but um, I, I'm observing a, a similar opportunity to Rani with respect to power. Uh, and I've uh, I've wondered several times in the recent past whether uh, geothermal ought to be comparing itself in terms of, uh, for example, levelized cost of electricity uh, to not to wind or solar or to gas, but to wind plus storage to uh, solar plus storage, uh, because those um, aspects are uh, quite um, quite expensive. And uh, so far with battery storage, uh, quite short duration. And I, I wonder whether uh, geothermal can be sufficiently dispatchable, sufficiently flexible that in grids that are dominated by um, wind and solar, that they can fill that intermittency gap uh, uh, quite nicely. At economics uh, that, uh, that work for the full system, as, as Rani was describing. I've got, I've got a, a, a question on this, Simon, D just based on the apparent indifference, at least in the US, uh, of valuing the 24 seven um, uh, feature of geothermal compared with solar and, uh, and wind. And, and ultimately it's the utility companies assuming we're using, we're looking at electricity for the moment, um, who make their decisions on how, they, on how they're going to source the, uh, the demands and, and balance, do the demand supply balance. And at the moment, certainly in the US, it doesn't seem that they're particularly interested. Now, it may well be because at the moment, geothermal is entirely marginal. Uh, and so far as I can say, it does not hold a strategic importance in trying to put together that supply demand balance. And I think that's probably where it's hard at the moment to persuade people to pay more for the fact it's 24 seven. It needs to be big and important before people will say, oh, OK, OK, we'll pay more then. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Tim. And, and, uh, and I, I can speak more knowledgeably about Texas uh, from where I'm uh, speaking. And uh, I, I think the root cause of Texas's problems is lack of uh, strategic planning and management of the grid, uh, not any individual uh, component. So once Texas wakes up to, yes, we need uh, a reliable, secure, affordable, and by the way, clean uh, grid and is regulated and controlled and planned to do that, then there'll be more appetite for um, uh, resources like geothermal. I think where some of the added value is going to come is as grids move to more and more uh, high levels of, of renewables or, or seek targets that are ever higher percentages of clean electricity. When states in the past have targeted you know, 30% or 40% clean electricity, that can be done uh, with plenty of other sources. And usually natural gas has been the, the main energy source that's been balancing uh, the variability of wind and solar. Most of what's getting added in the clean electricity space is wind and solar, that's the cheapest. But as you get to higher uh, percentages, whether driven by uh, policy, whether uh, driven by companies like, like Google that are insisting on 24 seven, you know, in the same grid um, electricity, you need something, it gets harder and harder to balance those variabilities of, of wind and solar. And where gas has done that historically, I see three reasons why, why we're not going that way. One is if you have a, a policy mandate or, or a desire for clean electricity, um, gas just can't do that or it's no longer cheap if you capture the carbon from that. Second, we've seen geopolitically that there's very 
big concern now about about where the gas uh, is coming from. And, and you know, of course, uh, having just come back from Europe where there's such a priority of, of reducing the dependence that that's really a, a big security threat to them um, from uh, where they're getting their natural gas from. And, and third is price, where I think a lot of the, the models that are predicting a small role for, for geothermal are assuming that gas is going to stay, stay abundant and, and cheap forever. And if you look at, at the prices, the gas is hitting uh, in Europe and in Asia and, and some parts of the world, it, it is still uh, low, but, but much higher than it was, um, then the value proposition comes in. And, and what I saw in, in the book is that where geothermal really has the potential, I think, is that, that it can be so modular. So even if it is you know, perhaps double the cost of, of wind or solar right now, um, it's got that scale, it's got that ability that as, as companies innovate, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for either the cost to come down or for it to become applicable um, in more reservoirs and more locations than, than it's been applied historically. So what I hear as I listen to, to all of you, I'll describe that as saying that not all demand is created equal, although in many markets we, we treat it as equal. Um, and so I've heard the split from Tim in terms of heat and how do we actually value heat differently or heat to displace other energy sources that are currently being used. Ronnie focusing really on, on the demand side of that question and base load. Um, and Simon as well, and, and Daniel bringing up, you know, what are the what are the market, you know, potential market mechanisms that would need to be used in order to actually uh, value a case like geothermal um, higher or, or pay for some of the aspects of geothermal that may be quite useful or beneficial. So I think there's two elements that we can come at this from. One is what can we do to encourage geothermal either in heating and cooling and power generation to come onto the market. And then there's also, what does geothermal need to do on the other side to help encourage cost competitiveness and, and, and bringing that down? And so perhaps, um, perhaps let's keep on this demand side for a few more minutes, because I think that's an incredibly important area. And uh, I'll throw it out to, to all of you. I know Ronnie, you've got your policy background, Daniel as well, you know, you've written a book um, touching on a number of these details and Simon and Tim coming at this from both the financial advisory side, investment advisory side, if you will, um, and trying to, to get it in place. What do you see as being these key market mechanisms that governments would need to put in place to encourage geothermal to, to move forward? Can I go first on that, Becky? Sure, absolutely. Jump on I in. Think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, one of the things we're seeing, um, and I think it's a great point Tim made, that you know when you look at different governments and different approaches to energy policy, there's really a very wide spectrum. You have that very um, carefully planned, carefully thought through, centrally controlled um, approach that China has, for example, all the way to very free market, very kind of... Um, um, you know, let's create a, a, a bare set of rules and see what happens and let the market dictate. And I think um, in order for the transition, the energy transition to go smoothly, energy is really core to um, so many, well, to everybody's economy, Everything. it's a question. And, you know, if you want to touch on points that Simon's raised as well around affordability, around making sure security of supply is there, the transition can be pretty bumpy if you leave it entirely to market forces. So the question for governments is what kind of framework is politically and economically acceptable? So you can see in Europe, for example, with carbon pricing very much in place, a lot of governments who are very used to a more planned approach, let's say our heavily regulated approach, we're seeing price subsidies and, uh, and strong support mechanisms and direction of travel. And then there are other economies where perhaps to Tim's point around um, in the US, but even in the US as a spectrum where California has uh, capacity pricing and Texas doesn't, for example. Mm. But what I don't see um, is that uh, the past is going to help, is gonna work for the future. All governments, all policy needs to um, support the energy transition and certainly to achieve net zero. Um, there needs to be a level of um, a coherent, strong framework that really incentivizes the right kind of energy mix. And what's missing a little bit, I think, is that um, that's caught many governments and many policymakers off guard. People haven't been ready for the speed that the transition will take. And that's unfortunate because it's just gonna mean that we have to move a lot faster than anybody had intended. Great points, Ronnie. And I'm curious, you know, putting it to, out to, to Simon and, and Daniel and Tim, of, of what examples have you seen actually where there is a recognition of that and there's been change to the market design to help encourage 
um, and make this a bit bit more of a smooth transition. I'd like to make a quick response because some of what Rani said, uh, I buy, but I also want to just say two things. I don't think it has to be uh, everybody rethinking how it's done. I think there are perfectly good models around the world uh, which show what can be done. And, and you mentioned, for example, I won't keep on talking about China, but I must say how impressed I am. Um, they, they, the central government set the, set the ball rolling, but they do have, once you go to the municipal level, so if you like regional government, it becomes far more of a capitalist type market. So a regional government is incentivized over there by having to achieve certain carbon targets. Uh, and, and they can do that anywhere they like. And what they found is that uh, by bidding for uh, geothermal electricity or in, in incentivizing companies to come and do that in their area, then they, they both receive cheaper electricity to their, uh, to, their, to their district heat networks. And of course they get the carbon credits. And so if you like the central, the central government set the ball rolling and said, okay, these are the rules guys, and now allow the market to decide how it's going to uh, uh, shake, shake down and do that in, in, in the end. Something. Yeah, Simon, please. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, to add some observations about what we're seeing uh, with customers uh, within the market. And um, so with respect to heating and cooling, uh, we're seeing um, large international companies. Um, we're approaching them mainly in Ireland and the UK at the moment. Uh, and they are absolutely desperate, not to exaggerate, uh, for cleaner, affordable um, solutions because everybody upstream of them in their supply chain and everybody downstream uh, of them, uh, their customers are demanding uh, a lower carbon uh, solution. And uh, that um, enables, uh, right at the beginning, to enable a conversation about how geothermal can fit into, uh, into that picture. And then ironically, um, in geothermal applications for lower temperature heating and cooling, of course, have been applied around the world, uh, uh, you know, for decades, uh, you know, including China, as, uh, as, as Tim has uh, indicated. So in terms of technological uh, application for lower temperature solutions, there's very little to do. And where it boils down to is uh, the balance of for example, uh, the electricity pricing that you require electricity for the heat pump systems. And sometimes the ratio of electricity price to natural gas price is too high and overcomes or overwhelms the efficiency of the, uh, the heat pump system. And, and so there will be occasions where I, I think we'll need uh, government help. set or rebalance the pricing of various different types of energy uh, as it relates to geothermal, uh, both complementary and competitive. Uh, and an example of that in part, many parts of Europe and the UK, there's actually more environmental levy and uh, social obligation taxes on electricity than there is on natural gas. Uh, and that, that, that seems a bit weird and, and, and needs to needs to change for broader reasons, as well as uh, uh, helping uh, heat pumps to, to work economically. From, from a system level perspective, where I see those geothermal heat pumps or district heating or other ways that we can have uh, heating provided by geothermal or reduce wintertime demand is I think we're going to see a trend over the next couple of decades towards uh, much higher peaks of wintertime demand, where even we got, got a preview of that last year with our blackouts in Texas, when uh, we saw demand, if, if it hadn't been blacked out, probably would have been as high as, as our hottest summer afternoons. But as you transition to a more electrified future, as you electrify more heating, as we have more electric cars and electric cars that, that don't operate as efficiently um, in the winter, we're going to see... Um, much higher and spikier peaks in wintertime demand. We're going to see some grids shift to the winter being as high or higher than, than the summertime peaks. And we're going to need more electricity. And so, um, and that the winter season is when of course, solar output is lowest. And, and sometimes during those cold periods, we don't get much wind. So the ability to um, both reduce demand, reduce load through geothermal and have the geothermal electricity uh, being more valued at those times, I think uh, provides sort of a double opportunity for geothermal to have real value to the system. Thanks, Ben.
We had a question come across on the Q&A, and so I just want you to, to open this one up. Perhaps a bit of a clarification on it is uh, in the Q, it's um, from uh, essentially market pricing, sorry, market minus carbon pricing plus trading. Does that, does that equal an incentive for geothermal? Do we think that is, is, is that the equation or what do we want to, to bridge across or to introduce to, the, to our audience here? Um, Ronnie. Yeah, go ahead, Ronnie. Ronnie, you go and then I'll, uh, I'll pitch in. Okay, no worries. Um, so I guess um, um, carbon pricing, particularly, let's say, um, Becky, in a European context, is um, really aimed at people who are replacing existing, let's say, fossil fuel or high carbon intensity um, uh, sources. So it's not a, um, a very easy and free mechanism today. It would be fantastic if it was, because absolutely where you're able to bid, um, you know, almost on a spot market, let's say, for um, power supply, that would, you know, you could add your carbon price. And it's very material. In Europe today, carbon pricing can easily increase um, by 30 to 50 percent the, uh, the value of, um, of power. So very, very material. The difficulty is that it's not a very liquid or very accessible um, mechanism. So typically what we're seeing is that um, in a lot of places, essentially it's the government who's acting as a proxy, who are taking, um, let's say, structurally looking at their energy supply um, and providing um, either a subsidy or some kind of regulated price for geothermal, taking into account carbon pricing. I think um, what we've seen in energy markets elsewhere is that as um, as supply becomes more mature, as customers get used to a particular kind of energy supply, for example, LNG over the last 20 to 30 years is a good case in point. It's gone from long term supply to spot markets to being priced almost as, as and when is needed. And I think that potential is there for geothermal. I just don't think we're there yet. It's not mature enough. It's not easy enough. It's not um, uh, transportable enough. I think what we're looking for is um, on the demand side, a really um, um, a stable mechanism for investors to invest. And that includes price, but it also includes risk. And um, I'm sure we'll touch on risk and I'm sure it's come up over the last few days. But that's a big part of um, the kind of geothermal um, value proposition. So carbon has a role to play. It's just not there yet. And I think um, uh, when that comes, it's going to be game changing for, uh, for geothermal. Okay. I just want to pick up. Uh, I, I agree that it's not quite there. What mm -hmm. I'm particularly excited about is the European uh, Commission's carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM, very horrible. Were a phrase, but but in essence, it comes in in January first next year. Uh, initially, uh, on five uh, commodities, uh, electricity surprisingly being one of them. Uh, the others, from recollection, are fertilizer, aluminium, uh, uh, steel, and uh, steel and uh, cement. I think it is. Maybe the fifth one might not be cement. But the point is, they put electricity in, in this very first tranche. Now, it gives people three to four years to get used to what this means. So anyone who who tries to import any of those products into the European Union will have to demonstrate how much carbon was used, not just within the unit production of whatever it was of steel or, or electricity, but everything to do with the operation that that particular firm had in producing that particular product. Now, I think this can have very wide ranging, uh, um, it could even have very wide implications, not just within the European Union or even the Asian landmass. It'll probably have implications for the USA when they start to trade these commodities uh, with the European Union, because they will find that they, that they will be verified, to use the jargon, by a European Union assessor, or to, who will then report how much carbon uh, that they've used. And then, the op the op the, then there's the option that the host government can tax to the same level that the European Union does, or that the host government could say, we're not taxing you, let the European Commission take the taxation. Now, of course, what's gonna happen, and it's already happened in Russia before the war, was that uh, the Russians said, oh no, we will make sure that we know exactly what the carbon content is, and we will take the tax dollars. That's my first point. The second rather uh, is when, when you produce electricity and heat together, uh, there is a, there's a, a, a battle about how much of the costs are attributed to the electricity and how much to heat. And when I used to work, on district heat for the European Commission back in the 90s, it was a very hot topic because you could either make or destroy a heat project uh, from a combined a combined heat and power, uh, whatever it's fossil fuel or, or geothermal. And so that, that has to be resolved. And it is a central policy uh, issue. It's a decision that we can made. The thermodynamics can, can work either way. But if you want to incentivize heat, 
then you need to uh, say that most of the costs sit with electricity and that heat is just a byproduct of that process. I guess turning to the United States from Europe here where we either don't have carbon pricing at all in most of the country or, or the Northeast states with the Reggie program, the most of the time the carbon prices uh, from their trading system have been low. What I see as the biggest policy driver here has been the, the renewable portfolio standards or the clean electricity standards um, where really remarkable, even when uh, the federal government was sort of moving backwards, you had 10 states all of a sudden commit to 100% clean electricity targets. President Biden has said he wants national to be 100% clean by 2035, but even if that goes nowhere, there are, I don't know what it is, nine or 10 states uh, that have to figure how they're going to get there. And those targets keep uh, you know, ramping up to, to head towards 100% by the 2040s. That means those the bar keeps getting higher and higher as they hit times in between. I think as you look to how are you going to um, get those higher and higher percentages and, and you start to hit saturation points or you start curtailing some of the output from, from wind and solar, I think there's going to be a growing interest in, in geothermal. You've seen that in California, um, several of the states that uh, are setting the most ambitious targets are in the West where we have some of the best geothermal uh, resources and where power could be traded across states. So, so I see a lot of potential even without a carbon price for some of these um, these targets, these these portfolio standards really having a big effect and really driving utilities to, to look to geothermal as really one of the best options for that blending they'll need. Yeah. So just to clarify, because a question came across, Daniel, and um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna send this one back to you just very for a very brief uh, response. So grid resilience, do you see geothermal as insurance to cope with spikes in peak demand over over winter or summer? I think it absolutely can. I think it because it can both reduce load and because it can provide supply. And I think there's going to be a growing interest in, in not seeing geothermal as just base load, but as flexible. I think there's, there's interest in how can it um, provide that resilience in markets where, where sometimes the prices have been zero or have been negative and other times the price is hitting three or $4,000 a megawatt hour and um, having sources that can, can ramp up and down rather than just operate flat out all the time, I think is, is going to be increasingly valued and, and provides a lot of resilience to some of these vulnerable grids. Maybe, maybe Becky, just to give an example of um, the um, demand side that uh, Daniel's pointing at. Um, in, in Ireland, for example, uh, there's a demand side response or demand side management uh, process where large electricity users, uh, two megawatts and above, um, uh, can get uh, fees for being available to the grid uh, to uh, either uh, supply electricity into the market if they've got combined heat and power units on their site or uh, uh, stop taking electricity from the, from the grid by shutting down uh, parts of their equipment. In a future where geothermal heat pumps are uh, supplying most, if not all, of the uh, heating and cooling to an industrial size facility of two megs and above, or a group of uh, of demand demand side uh, uh, units, um, then you can be a demand side player by shutting down the heat pumps so long as your process allows it, or use storage to store the heat uh, during the period that, uh, which you're shutting down uh, the heat pumps. So uh, Daniel's spot on, and, and the, there's an example of how how this can work. Thanks, Simon. But do, I'm gonna take a little bit of a time out on the demand side, if I may. I think it's absolutely critical and I think it drives essentially everything else throughout the market. But I, wanted, I want us to jump back from the demand side, getting back over to essentially the, the supply side of geothermal, if you will. And yesterday in our session, we talked about uh, a kind of a range of cost savings for, for heating and power, heating and cooling and power generation between 20 and, and 60%. And if we start to get to that 60% level savings, then you really start to see that actually geothermal power generation is, is really quite competitive. And I would argue in many places, actually, I think heating and cooling is, is competitive today. Um, but what do you see as being those, those key levers or perhaps government intervention? What are the things that we need to do as an industry to be able to drive down those costs? Maybe just one minute from, from everyone that has some thoughts in there. Ronnie, go 
Yeah, thanks, Becky. I guess um, um, it comes back to this point, Becky, around um, transferring system price or the value that geothermal really adds from a system perspective to Daniel's point around um, how it can enable um, an energy transition or renewable um, level of 80 plus percent in the in the grid um, and, and being able to translate that actually to a price. Because what happens today is that um, it's very difficult for geothermal to um, geothermal projects to actually secure those sorts of prices. But if we look in Europe, for example, where um, you know, retail pricing is, is easily good enough to support many geothermal power projects right across Europe. And that's a combination of, um, uh, okay, currently high prices, but it's also a question of, um, as you look at a shift from coal, um, perhaps some, um, uh, you know, energy security questions as well. Absolutely. So there's really a, a, a question about what that value really is. And, the, and I think the issue that we're seeing is almost, um, Perhaps it's too strong to call it a market failure, but certainly if you compi combine energy security, um, carbon pricing in terms of or uh, you know um, environmental externalities, let's say, and uh, the question of um, system security, that pricing is not being reflected transparently to geothermal projects. So adding those together or enabling that to happen, I think is a role that governments can play. I'm not suggesting that it's all about subsidy or all about um, uh, what's the phrase, uh, kind of somehow um, creating a, a price, only a price environment, but it's about creating a framework and that framework doesn't exist. I mean, geothermal licensing doesn't, it just full stop doesn't exist in most countries around the world. So there's quite a lot for, for folks to do. One framing I would see is we need to look what worked for other forms of electricity and how do we mimic that with geothermal? So two of my favorite interviews of the hundred or so I did in researching my book were with um, Greg Nimmit and Varun Sivaram, who've both written terrific books about solar, especially uh, Professor Nimmit from, from Wisconsin. His book is How, did, How Solar Became Cheap. And it really took um, what, what I frame as, as push policies and as pull policies. So push policies, meaning what do we do to, to improve the supply of, of innovation and technology? How do we have research and development. I'm really encouraged with what's happening uh, with the Forge site in Utah that, that the US government has been funding that's become a test bed for testing new geothermal technology. So how can we have that R&D uh, that, that hopefully more and more countries will start funding to get the technology supply, but then you need demand. You need that market demand pull that, that, that so the technologies don't just stay in the lab, but, but you need that learning by doing. And with solar, with with so many different products, you find that that with each doubling of deployment, there's there's a learning curve that's often been about an 18% uh, reduction in cost for each uh, doubling of, of deployment. And, and geothermal is so tuned to that. That's why it means so much when, when Google and other companies are, are becoming those first adopters. When we have states like California that are, that are finding they need geothermal to adopt it, um, that it's getting that learning by doing curve going and, and I think it has that potential because it's modular. So much of how it's produced really could follow the way fracking uh, became cheap, the way others, whereas unfortunately nuclear has not, nuclear cost has gone up while solar costs have fallen by nearly 90%. It's because when you can keep doing so, when you have the demand, when you have that learning by doing, when something is modular, like I think geothermal can be, that that pull can, can make it uh, where you really become a, a self-perpetuating cycle, a virtuous cycle of of more and more uh, deployments at lower and lower costs and, and better uh, performance with it. That's Can a great point. Oh, go on. Go on, Simon. I'm like a contrarian, so why don't you say your bit? Yeah, yeah I, I was going to uh, pull it back to the original uh, question about the, the, the technical aspects of the economics, um, if I may. And um, uh, you know, observing that there's two distinct conversations between utility scale electricity and distributed solutions or heat network scale uh, heating and cooling. Uh, and they, they, they are two different beasts. Um, but nevertheless, the, the economics uh, are are driven by um, two or three very simple efficiencies. Uh, the, the first one on the subsurface is dollars per watt <laughs> extracted. Um, and that's controlled by dollars per meter of drilling and, uh, and uh, watts per meter of heat harvesting. And so everything that we can do, including crossover of oil and gas capability and expertise, 
into driving a Swanson's law like decline or improvement in those two efficiencies, decline in cost, but improvement in, in the two efficiencies is most welcome. And then on the top side, it's actually a similar story for um, expander turbines that are generating electricity uh, for low temperature heat, uh, you know, 100, 120 degrees centigrade. The uh, current efficiencies are pretty lousy for organic Rankine cycle turbines. And therefore, uh, I'm excited to see earlier in the week, the SAGE team, for example, talking about uh, using CO2 driven turbines uh, to, to be much, I think they said double the efficiency of organic Rankine cycle turbines. And so it is with heat pumps. If you're turning the uh, Rankine cycle into a Carnot cycle instead, uh, efficiency is really important. And the, and the better we can do with that, uh, the, the, you're so much the good. So for example, I, I'm in conversation with the OEM manufacturer of heat pumps that have got a uh, heat pump that works on CO2 and its efficiencies are fabulous. Um, uh, and will help the economics uh, a lot. Now, if we can just drive down the yeah. cost for those, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've had two days of uh, brilliant people uh, talking about just this very topic. And I think I'd like to profess the fact that I do not know how to reduce the costs of, uh, of downhole drilling uh, or indeed of uh, surface facilities or how to increase the system efficiency. I'd make an observation, which actually I picked up from Daniel, which was I'm gonna say anyway in a different way which is if you look at nuclear, it's become ridiculously expensive. And why? Because various uh, regulatory boards have decided to pile more and more safety measures on the view, on the, in the hope that they will stop a meltdown of some description or a, or a widespread uh, cause of death. And I'm wondering whether there are ways of reducing, picking up on yesterday's uh, comments you had, Becky, reducing standards uh, so that we reduce costs. Now, I don't, know, I don't know how to do it. And of course, it's a dirty word, but I, I believe, uh, according to Arctic Energy, uh, that it costs half a million dollars to drill a geothermal well to 2,200 meters in China. And if you look at how much it'll cost in Europe, it's several times more. I don't know what they're doing. I, do, I have used uh, equipment from around the world and looked at drilling operations. They're not particularly different, not particularly different uh, numbers of safety issues. But if we think for a moment, are we using the right standards for drilling these wells? Sure, there may be hydrocarbons at high levels, in which case we have to case them off. But generally speaking, have a think about that. Maybe that's a way to cut costs. Yeah, and I think there's an element that there, in some cases, just there are not industry standards, which actually prevent the growth of markets for some of the, the service companies that would be able to move across. Um, and as Ronnie was saying earlier, there are in many locations not not regulations to be able to actually support geothermal. Simon, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a cousin of uh, uh, over overpowering industry standards, uh, and the cousin's called "We've always done it this way." Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, what we're noticing uh, as we look into drilling costs um, in partnership with Drill Tech and Baker Hughes is that the very first conversation is, well, what is a radically de-scoped for purpose well, and in our case, borehole, because uh, we're, we're in some closed loop, what does that actually look like? And, and then let's talk about uh, what the physical impediments to that are, and then the legislative impediments uh, to that. And it, it completely unravels this, well, we've always done it this way, so that therefore that's the, 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 the right way. And the same, of course, applies to other parts of the system. But but Tim Tim's absolutely right. Drilling costs is the one we need to to really uh, you you yeah. put her, put the cold tile over our heads and, and think really differently about it. So, I mean, you touched on you touched on. Oh, sorry, Ronnie, go ahead. Do you want to jump in really briefly? Well, I was just going to say um, um, I agree with um, what Simon said about um, it's not so much that we need to think of it as um, changing standards. I think it's about engineering for the right problem. And rather than engineering for an oil and gas well, what we're trying to do here is something so different. And I think what it takes is some good engineering, a blank sheet of paper, and, you know, some pretty basic laws of physics to, to really come up with the right answer. And, and we can do that. That's that's not difficult. I think the, um, the other interesting area for me, particularly looking at power and um, 
of open loop systems rather than closed loop systems is predictability. And if you look at performance in the geothermal sector, it's been abysmal. I mean, you don't have to talk to very many investors to see how many fingers have been burnt and how many hopes have been disappointed and dashed over the years. And I think this is something where oil and gas skills really come in. I mean, we have uh, the oil and gas sector is by no means a stellar sector of performance either. But one of the things that we get beaten into us, I think, uh, through our early careers is about predictability, about uncertainty, about being really um, being able to characterize a subsurface in some depth. And I think if you look at those two things in combination, I really think there is a lot to do here and really an enormous amount to play for. So I'm super excited. I think um, this combination of skills, market and what the world really needs it is an enormous opportunity for geothermal. How do we reduce the risk of the, the next operation in the floor? Sorry, Daniel, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, I'd like to push back on, on a point that Tim made, uh, is that I really, as an environmental engineer, I don't want to see us um, relaxing the standards for safety or environmental performance. Um, to me, no, what uh, we need to, um, it, it needs to be, it's, it's a new technology. A lot of communities aren't used to having uh, geothermal drilling um, in their vicinities. And we need to, to show for, for the social license, for the ability to really scale this up, we need to show that um, that it can be as clean and as low impact as possible, that it won't trigger seismicity, that it won't trigger spills. Um, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think that it, it's differentiating itself from from fracking for oil and gas and and has that license. Because to me, what what's most important is that it can scale up, that you do, uh, the first time and then the 10th time and by the 100th time uh, those costs really come down you get more of the supply chain and the other things that can bring down the cost and so you know, there might be a short term gain by cutting corners and, and saving money on the first few wells but but if you lose that social acceptance if you you know we we would want communities local governments state governments to to want this to be out of their community to see jobs to see uh, environmental protection from it and and that growth, that ability to to learn by doing and and get that scale, I think uh, needs the highest standards. Just like I think um, for fracking, I think the oil and gas industry has realized they need to clean up um, their wastewater water disposal. They need to get the methane leaks as low as possible uh, for them to be viable. And so I I hope this can be done with with not excessive, not 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 needless standards that really don't do any good, but but anything that is making it more locally acceptable, I think, is very important. Uh, since, since I'm the one that's, uh, that, that's, that's uh, you, you're saying, I, I, I'll give you an example. Okay, so and it's a UK one, so it's it's a bit local, not necessarily. Is if you look at the standards for uh, micro seismicity events uh, for oil and gas wells, for fracking oil and gas wells, and you compare those with quarrying and indeed geothermal, then you'll find out that the quarrying ones and the geothermal ones are multiple times more generous, and uh, and still are equivalent to a, a heavy lorry driving past your uh, your front door. Now, that's what I mean. Uh, it, mm. uh, that's, that was a question of somebody saying, oh, well, let's make sure the, uh, the public are OK with this. Uh, and as a result of which, they heaped standards onto uh, a sector which basically destroyed the sector. And I, and I push back and say, no, you have to look at these things rationally and say, we will lead, we will win people over for what is a vital resource. Rani talked about something that, that's so close to my mind. She was talking about how you look at risk and uncertainty uh, within the subsurface. I've got to make a pitch uh, for an equivalent to the petroleum resource management system. Um, Professor Joy of Falcone, who was on Becky's panel yesterday, she did a sterling piece of work using PRMS 2007 for the United Nations ECE, and they adopted it as one of their standards in 2017. I, the, nobody I've spoken to in the financial community has looked at it or used it. Now, what I'm thinking is if SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, uh, were to, uh, to adopt or were to develop something based on Professor Falcone's work, which was much more recognizable for investors in oil and gas projects, and to say, OK, well, it's, it's PRMS, but it's applied to geothermal, then we may have a chance to start to stimulate the proper debate among equity investors and debt investors, banks, whether it's resource-based uh, resource lending or other instruments, uh, high yield debt or royalties, uh, that people can start to have confidence with around the world uh, and not the localized uh, calculations that are done by Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, EBRD, whoever it might be, all getting their own, their own bunch of experts in. 
Ten minutes are great. I'm going to step us back just one moment because I want to do get one more roundtable before we before we close out. We've got about five minutes left. Building on what you were just saying, Tim, because essentially, if I may paraphrase, you're saying how do we describe the subsurface and describe that in a consistent fashion, Ronnie? How do we get to the level of predictability with the with the subsurface and also the outcomes of of the operations? And Simon, how do we you know building on Tim? How do we drive the cost down? I mean, how do we actually get the operational efficiencies up, whether it's using CO2 turbines or other? Out, outside of that realm, are what are the other value chains? What are the other levers that you see that can help move geothermal forward? And we've got about one minute for, for everyone before we're going to have to close. And so um, perhaps, um, Simon, can I start with you on this one, on, on what do you see uh, that, that's happening externally or what is your team working on? Yeah, the, 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 we're referring to them at the moment as ancillary revenue streams. Um, so the primary one is is uh, having the customer pay for the heat or the cooling uh, load that, that is provided. Um, but then when you start to look at it from an energy as a service or a heat as a service um, business model, then all sorts of different uh, uh, revenues or different um, uh, sources of value start to jump in. I've already mentioned uh, the demand side management um, aspect. There's also an arbitrage on electricity uh, pricing that can be done, run your heat pump at night uh, when it's when the electricity is cheaper, uh, for example. Um, we've also touched on uh, uh, carbon trading within the existing European trading system. Uh, those those carbon avoidances are, are actually valuable. They have some value, maybe not as liquid as we might like, as Rani was pointing out. But it, but it's another uh, it's another value stream. And um, uh, when you look at geothermal's role in providing that, it's not just a, as a source of heat. It's actually as a store of heat. Uh, it, 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 geothermal resources are well way able to store uh, heat uh, months, years. Uh, uh, and deal with seasonal problems like taking summer waste heat, storing it for the winter, uh, and, and using it in the in the winter. So uh, we're we're really seeing geothermal resources as a as a pivotal uh, part of the pattern, uh, a, a a fulcrum uh, within uh, within these distributed energy systems with lots of different types of revenue. Simon, brilliant. I'm just going to go around the table. So Ronnie, Tim, and then end with Daniel, if I may. So Ronnie, please. Yeah, I guess um, the other thing I would echo um, is something that Daniel mentioned around repeatability and scale. A lot of geothermal projects around the world are really focused around um, hydrothermal vents, you know, ring of fire type stuff. And it's great. You know, they, they clearly have um, very strong economics. But if you look at the future, what we're looking at are very large um, spaces with hot aquifers where scale really matters. And I think to Dan's point around repeatability and um, um, and risk, you know, if you can have a project that's, let's say, a gigawatt in scale rather than five megawatts, which is almost seems to be the average within the European context, you're suddenly talking about, um, you know, a risk to reward ratio that's much, much more attractive. So there is something here around value simply from ambition and around scale and around repeatability and around good engineering. So, uh, and I think none, I haven't seen a project like that scoped anywhere yet around the world. So it'd be exciting to see that develop. And maybe that's a lead into Dan, so uh, he, can, uh, he can talk more about that. And maybe OGL will be helping to develop that. So please. So. Tim. I think looking at a commercial uh, value chain, um, having having smallish geothermal companies, most at the moment are uh, um, even even all that you know a few billion dollar market cap, uh, team up with big customers, uh, maybe utility companies picking up Ronnie's point, maybe people who know and understand how to put big projects together does two things. One is it means the balance sheet against which you finance is more efficient. So you, you will reduce the weight average cost of capital by the customer and the geothermal company acting in consort when they go to the bank or the, the equity investors and say, here we are, we've got the, the markets already proven. This is just another way of, of, of introducing the upstream energy. And I think I said it, but the important that you've got people who understand how to de-risk the project construction phase. And, uh, and that may well be where the big oil companies come in or, or whatever else, but you do need to look at de-risking the whole thing, not just the subsurface. Thanks, Tim. 
And where, Daniel, where I think so much value comes in is when there are commitments to 100% clean electricity. I think as cities, states, countries, um, companies like Google and so many other data center operators try to find how are we going to get 100% clean electricity, wind and solar are going to be the backbone, but they really are running out of options when they figure how are they going to get that last 10, 20% of the mix. Batteries are great for one, two, maybe four hours, uh, but they don't get you through what the Germans call the, the Dunkelflaut, the, the, the dark doldrums that, that you have a couple of weeks, two or three weeks of time when you don't get much output from those. We're not going to build much new nuclear in the next uh, at least 10 years. Uh, batteries can only take us so far and um, almost by default, there's I think going to be this growing need of figuring how can geothermal provide that firm and flexible power to get us to that last uh, bit of these targets. Thanks, Daniel. I'd like to thank everyone that's been able to join us for today. Daniel, can't wait to read the book. Simon and Ronnie and Tim, I can't wait to see where you drag your projects to, what advice we're able to give and how we're, we're able to, to change geothermal moving into the future. So thank you all for joining me today. Have a wonderful day and thanks for sharing your thoughts with our audience. Thanks, Becky. Thank you, Becky.